Welcome back, everyone. We're going to continue to look at some more history today. I'm going to be taking you into the third and even into the fourth century uh, in regards specifically to our topic, at least as of right now, which is the Sabbath. Now, the first thing I want to bring to the table is a gentleman known by the name Victorinus of Patau. And Victorinus is considered to be this, you know, profound theologian, this prolific writer. And he's known for two specific works. The first is on the apocalypse, and the second is on the creation of the world. And it's that latter one that we're going to zero in on and look at what he has to say specifically in regard to the Sabbath. Obviously, if you're going to talk about on the creation of the world— uh, what did God embed into creation? The Sabbath. This is certainly going to come up, and it does. I want to show you what he says. He says this, This sixth day is called the Perceive, that is to say, the preparation of the kingdom. I want to stop here. Unfortunately, you know, after this statement, Victorinus is going to completely derail. But what he says here is very much so worthy of note. Because this perceive, if you're not from, this is the preparation day. This is what we call Friday. And traditionally, even in the New Testament, this can be seen. Friday, you prepare for the Sabbath that is coming. You, 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 you cook the food you need to cook so you're not cooking on the Sabbath. You clean, you do all the cleaning, all the necessary work that needs to be done around the house, in and outside. You do that on Friday, making sure that when you enter into the Sabbath, you are ceasing from your works as God did from his. And so this is, it's a, it's a very important time of the week. But the language that Victorinus uses here is that he says this preparation day, you're preparing for the kingdom. And I got to tell you, there is a deep spiritual connotation that goes with the Sabbath, that goes with that preparation day, because the preparation day is preparing for the kingdom, because the Sabbath is actually a picture of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. There is going to be a millennial Sabbath rest, where the earth has 6,000 years, and in the 7,000th year, there is going to be a rest from God, even, even uh, you know, Barnabas talks about, uh, or the epistle talks about this reality of the template at creation. Uh, you apply the thousand years, and one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. In other words, it's, it's commonly known that God marked out the whole history of the world at creation. We're taking seven days, well, there's going to be seven days of the, that what the humanity is going to experience as you go 6,000 years and then the 7,000 year will be the, the reign of Jesus. And that's going to be a time of rest where God wipes away all the tears from the eyes and there's no more sorrow and there's no more pain. That is true Sabbath. That is true rest. And, and, and so this time here on earth is truly preparing for the kingdom of God, in a very real way, on a prophetic level, we experience every preparation day, every Friday, we are reminded that our time here, it is to prepare for the kingdom of heaven as we go into the Sabbath. And we practically do this by the observance of the day itself. And so what he says here at the beginning, the sixth day is called the perceive, that is to say, the preparation of the kingdom. It's, it's, it's deeply profound. But now he's going to derail. And he goes on and says, and let the perceive become a rigorous fast, lest we should appear to observe any Sabbath with the Jews, which Christ himself, the Lord of the Sabbath, says by the prophets that his soul hateth which Sabbath uh, he in his body abolished. Now, I ask you, does this at all sound familiar? Well, it should, because this is the exact narrative that we read about in the epistle of Barnabas. 
drawing from the very same passage with the identical interpretation that God hates his Sabbath and Jesus did away with it. Jesus abolished it. Uh, neither of which is true. And, and, and that it shows you, this goes to show you, just how influential that narrative in Barnabas was on the Christian church. Because, you know, Barnabas is estimated to be written uh, at, at the earliest late, late first century, more likely around early second century. That's when it's estimated to be written. And here we are in the late third century in the writings of Victorinus. And all this time has gone by and the same narrative is being echoed. I mean, Victorinus is an echo chamber for the epistle of Barnabas. And, and, and again, this shows you how significant this idea became in Christian thought. And, you know, it's, it's getting into the time where this is going to become crystallized because, you know, as you get into the, into the fourth century, someone rises to power in Rome and it changes the landscape of, of, of the Christian world. And that man is Constantine. Prior to Constantine rising to power, the Christian was being burned at the stake, thrown into the Colosseum, being treated worse than dogs. They were hated. They had no rights under Roman power. They were, they were persecuted brutally. And this is no mystery. Everyone recognizes this reality. Even secular scholars recognize this. But with the rise of Constantine, and you, you think of pivotal moments like the Nicene Council, 8325, which we'll talk about, not today. We'll get into that later. The landscape changed. Christianity started, it, it became a protected faith. Christians, for the first time ever under Roman law, had the freedom and protection to express their Christian faith. This was a very very different world. And then ultimately with the rise of Theodosius, who would be emperor of Rome, the last emperor that had unified Rome, it, Christianity became the official state religion on, under his uh, power. And so very different experience. What the apostles experienced by being put to death uh, under Roman power uh, it was very, very different experience than, uh, for the most part, what Christians would experience later on under this, this new Rome, uh, even to the point it becomes Christianity becomes the official state religion. Now, that said, I want to take you to AD 363-64, and a very special council came together. And I want to show you a few of the canons that come forth. Uh, unfortunately, not all the canons, and there's estimated about 60 canons that were produced in this council. Not everything was kosher, as they say. Some things, biblically speaking, were very unkosher. And uh, I, I want to show you these things because, again, where we're at today is a product of our past. And so the first canon is this. It's canon 37. And I'm going to I'm going to throw both of these canons up together, 37 and 38. 37 says it is not lawful to receive portions sent from the feasts of the Jews or heretics, nor to feast together with them. Moving to Canon 38, it is not lawful to receive unleavened bread from the Jews, nor to be partakers of their impiety. Now I want you to recognize something. Something monumental has happened in Christianity. See, isn't it interesting that when Jesus came and he commissioned his Jewish apostles to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, we're told by Paul that the middle wall of separation had been taken down by the power of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. And now the Jew and Gentile were to come and be echad, so one that it would mimic the oneness of the Father and the Son. But now we're looking at these supposed Christian councils 
actually laying tracks to prohibit the unification of the Jew and of the Gentile. And again, we're not simply, we're not talking about Orthodox Jews here. We're talking about Messianic Jewish Christians. This is what we're talking about. And no longer are are the Gentile Christians being allowed to be one with the Jewish Christians. This is absolutely satanic. This is demonic to the point they actually say in these canons, you can't even, a Christian, a, a Gentile Christian who's come into the faith can't even receive unleavened bread, which you know, during the Feast of Passover, and, and we'll get into this on a much deeper level uh, in, in the coming weeks, uh, but Gentile Christians were keeping the Passover. We know this for a historical fact. But now this canon is coming on the scene and says you're no longer allowed to feast together with the Jews. You're no longer to practice Passover. You're not allowed to receive unleavened bread during the time of Passover. You are not allowed to do this. Based on what scriptural authority? Where's the scripture for that? Because I don't see that. I see everything but that. It, in fact, it's ironic. And again, we'll get into this on a much deeper level later on. But the Apostle Paul commissions the Gentile Christians in Corinth to observe the Passover. And so it's just... You know, I, I can't help but hear the apostles' words in my ears, ringing in my ears, whether it's right in the sight of God, to listen to you more than to God you judge. And, and this is what it's come to. Now, look at this next canon. This is canon 29. It says, Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath but must work on that day. Stop right here. Again, those words, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. God commanded us to rest on the Sabbath, but now man has come on the scene and says, no, no, you can't Judaize by resting on the Sabbath. No, you're Judaizing. You need to honor the Lord's Day. Look at what it goes on. Rather, honoring the Lord's Day, and again, this will be a subject that we'll get into the details of later. And if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. This boggles the mind. What they're saying, what this council has determined and their supposed wisdom is that if you go out and actually listen to God and keep the commandments of God, of which they, they lay this negative connotation over with the, with the verbiage of Judaizing, to live as Jews, if you do that, you deserve to be cut off from Christ because you went to obey him. I mean, you, you want to talk about baffling logic. This baffles the mind. Well, we're not done with this canon. There's something about this that I want to dig into on a much deeper level that we need perspective of. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. Uh, Join us in our next episode. May the Lord bless you and keep you.